but uh, we're happy, happy to have uh, Wolfgang Baylors, uh, is that how you say it? <laughs> uh, to tell us uh, from Rutgers. He was previously a student uh, at Stony Brook with the Nebula study. I guess we all know this because we're out at lunch. And um, they've been ma making some nice progress in uh, 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 strong coupling uh, field theories and uh, things you can say about them that previously people thought maybe you wouldn't know how to do. So he's going to tell us today about uh, deformation quantization and three-dimensional CFDs. Thank you very much. It's a great pleasure to be here and to have the opportunity to tell you about this paper I wrote in collaboration with Chris Bean and Leonardo Astelli. So we are all familiar with the statement that the conformal field theory is completely specified by this so-called conformal data, which consists of two pieces of information. First, there is the spectrum of local operators, which uh, is organized in representations of the uh, conformal algebra and any other symmetry algebra theory you might have. And secondly, there is a collection of three-point functions, CIJKs, three-point couplings, for any three local operators. Of course, there will be redundancies if I say for any three, because again, this organization in terms of representation of the conformal algebra and other symmetry algebras. But this, the fact that this few conformal data is enough to reconstruct the CFT, or at least all of its um, correlation functions of finitely many local operators, is a consequence of the operator product expansion being a convergent expansion which allows me to replace any two local operators inserted at separated points by the sum over all the local operators in the theory. The structure constants of this operator product expansion are again these three-point couplings and uh, by using your VE uh, iteratively I can replace any endpoint function by a sum over n minus one point functions. Again I can apply the OPE to any two local operators replaced by n minus two point functions and so forth, all the way down to one point functions, which all have to vanish in a conformal field theory, except for the ones of the identity operator. So very good. I have this conformal data, which comes with this tool, the operator product expansion, but of course it's clear that not any conformal data will define for me a consistent conformal field theory. There's very stringent consistency conditions on this data, which go under the name of the conformal bootstrap equations. The conformal bootstrap equations essentially tell me that the operator product algebra, that is the algebra of local operators, which have as its product this OPE, must be associative. Or it's more commonly phrased as a requirement that any four point function of four local operators should be crossing symmetric. So the question one should ask now is, given these strong conformal bootstrap constraints telling me that the OPE of any two, well, of any triple of local operators should be associative, is that enough to solve for the conformal field theory? Can I use these consistency conditions to actually solve the CFT? And the answer to this question is no in general, except for in two dimensions where there is a case of rational conformal field theories which has been successfully solved using the conformal bootstrap. And the reason that this approach does not work in general is simply the fact that the spectrum of local operators which you had over here generically involves an infinite number of representations of the symmetry algebra and the conformal bootstrap equations themselves are then an infinite system of coupled functional equations involving this infinite amount of conformal data. So there's really no way of uh, and it's not a clear way how to attack solving these uh, equations. But in the recent literature, there's been different approaches, uh, ex there have been different ex uh, approaches explored to actually make progress in solving or at least truncating what CFTs are possible. Um, so one approach has been numerical bootstrap, which has been extremely successful in uh, putting bounds on OP coefficients or on conformal dimensions of operators. The approach here is that you just take one or a few four-point functions and analyze what crossing symmetry has to say about the constraints on the internal leg. Another approach is to look at uh, the light cone limit where you take two operators and let them approach each other on the light cone. The approach I would take is 
uh, to introduce more symmetry. Instead of just conformal symmetry, I would like you to look, uh, study theories with superconformal symmetry. And in these theories, it has become clear recently by the work by Chris Bingley and I'm studying myself, and Madre Alemos, Pedro Altiendo, and Baltanaris, that you can actually um, carve out an exactly solvable subset, subsector of the conformal field theory, which you can solve. So, in N plus <coughs> 2 theories, in four dimensions, that was the first example we studied, you can find a truncation, which you can solve exactly, that takes the form of a Carroll algebra. Similarly, in 2,0 theories in 6D, you can also carve out a Carroll algebra. And in this talk, I will be looking at three-dimensional n equals four theories. And I will show you first that you can define a 1D topological algebra. which is solvable and, in fact, takes the form of a quantization information. And any of these uh, truncations, which you can define in superconformal field theories, they use a cohomological construction. So you just identify a clearly chosen nilpotent supercharge. You look at its cohomology classes. And instead of looking at the algebra of all local operators, you start looking at the algebra of these cohomology classes. And these algebra cohomology classes take this simpler form, which you may actually be able to solve. So, that was introduction. So before starting... Do you need uh, supersymmetry to uh, get hold of such a uh, subalgebra? I mean, how essential is it? Well, in, in the way I approach the problem, it's very essential, because I said I will look at an important supercharge. So I need supersymmetry to be able to identify such an important supercharge. So before uh, talking about this cohomological construction that will eventually give me this topological algebra, I'd like to briefly recall some notions uh, that will be relevant in this talk about three-dimensional n equals four superconformal field theories. So their symmetry algebra is given by OSP 4 slash 4 R, whose bosonic subgroup is of course SO4 plus SP4R, where the SP4R is a space-time symmetry which is isomorphic to SO3,2, which you all recognize as the usual conformal algebra in three dimensions. And the SO4 is an R symmetry, which I will write as SU2C plus SU2H. Here the C and H, they stand for Coulomb and Higgs because these symmetries, they act isometrically on the Higgs branch or the Coulomb branch of vacua of these three-dimensional n equals four theories. So uh, also notice that this SU2C and SU2H, they, act, uh, they appear on perfectly equal footing. So I can as may as well restrict myself to considering just SU2H. And everything I say, you can, if you like, translate to SU2C without any change except for the letter H and C. So the Higgs branch, for the Coulomb branch, but I will not talk about Coulomb anymore, the Higgs branch <coughs> of three-dimensional n equals four superconformal field theories is a hyperkähler cone. The fact that it is a cone is easily understood because it must allow for the action of the dilatation operator. And the fact that it's a hyperkähler manifold is but it follows from the same reasons as why the Higgs branch in n equals two superconformal field theory in four dimensions with a hyperkähler cone. It simply, if you think about the Lagrangian construction, you can think of giving best to the scalars in the hypermultiplets, subject to the relations that the D term and F terms need to vanish, and modding out by the gauge group. But this entire construction in mathematical literature is just a hyperkähler quotient. We started off with a hyperkähler manifold, the trivial C to the 4n, where n is the number of hypermultiplets, so you'll end up with a hyperkähler manifold. In this construction, the, the Higgs branch does not receive quantum corrections, so it remains hyperkähler all the way to the infrared. So the most important piece of information that we actually need from the fact that the Higgs branch takes this nice geometrical form is 
that if I look at if I look at it in any complex structure, it will come naturally endowed with a Poisson bracket. A, a Poisson bracket on its ring of holomorphic functions. So I think of the Higgs branch, I look at the holomorphic functions where the holomorph holomorphicity is defined with respect to the complex structure I picked. And that ring will come naturally endowed with a Poisson bracket, which is essentially a remnant of the two other Kähler structures which I sort of forgot when I look at a single complex structure. But anyway, the bottom line is it comes with a Poisson bracket, and this Poisson bracket will reappear later on as a natural ingredient of this deformation quantization. So finally, I would like to mention that this ring of holomorphic functions or the Higgs branch looked at in any complex structure, in physics language, it is actually the Higgs branch chiral ring. So the Higgs branch chiral ring is isomorphic to this holomorphic coordinate ring. And it, and it is defined just by local operators, which are scalars, Lorentz scalars. They are additionally singlets under this SU2C algebra. Moreover, they sit in the highest weight state of the SU2H representation. And the conformal dimension is precisely equal to the SU2H charge. So this is a concise um, characterization of higgs branch chiral ring operators. And this higgs branch chiral ring operators, the ring of higgs branch chiral ring operators, is precisely isomorphic to the holomorphic coordinate ring, the ring of holomorphic functions over the higgs branch. Could you repeat what you said for the last two lines? Because I can't really hear it. What did you say? What did that say? highest weight of SU2H. So these operators, they sit in some representation of SU2H and they are the top component of that representation. And the last line is that their conformal dimension is precisely equal to the SU2H charge. But you don't fix that representation? It could be any representation? So in general, a higgs branch chiral ring operator will look like some operator, it's scalar, singular that under SU2C, transforms into some representation of S to H, say in spin K over 2, then it will have K indices totally symmetric, of course they're all the same, because they need to sit in the highest weight representation. So in my convention that means one plus S. Well, so this is a generic X branch power ring of the yes. Does the C2 um, act geometrically <coughs> on the hypercalor Sure, yes. Um, so the S2H it acts First of all, isometrically on the hyperclear cone, but while it acts, it also rotates the three complex structures, okay. so it's, it's not a hyperclear And I said it was a cone structure, so it really rotates the three complex structures while rotating the three complex structures. So that is why uh, if I choose a complex structure to describe holomorphic functions, that notion translates to choosing a Kapton generator in SU2H. Mm -hmm. So this the six branch chiral ring picked for me a Kapton generator, which is here. It's the same as, as a complex structure I chose to describe all one functions. So this is really all I will need in this talk about 3D and plus 4 theories. So let me move on to actually construct an I promised this cohomological construction. So as I said before, the, the trick is to identify a certain nilpotent supercharge. And once I have this nilpotent supercharge, I can start studying its cohomology classes. And then instead of looking at the full operator product algebra, the algebra of all local operators, with that product OBE, I will start looking at the algebra of cohomology classes. And this algebra I claim will eventually be this 1D topological algebra. So let me start by actually schematically at least identifying the supercharge. It is of the form Poincare supercharge. I will omit all the indices, but if you insist, I can, I can get 
student plus some uh, special conformal supercharge. So this is a somewhat unconventional combination of supercharges, but it is what works for us. And in fact, I will add a totally arbitrary complex number here, which I call zeta. Notice that the value of this zeta is totally arbitrary because I can always act with an outer automorphism of my algebra and change the value of zeta at will. So it's really just a bookkeeping device. And in fact, you can see the bookkeeping purpose in this expression. Imagine I would insist that Q has a proper eigenvalue under the conformal, uh, under the dilatation. So it has proper conformal dimension. Q has dimension half, S has dimension minus half. So I can think of zeta as carrying conformal dimension one. And similarly, although I didn't write all the indices, you can think of it as carrying SU2H charge one. So it's really just a bookkeeping device that will tell me about conformal dimension and SU2H charge. Notice that there is no reason whatsoever that Q should be having a proper eigenvalue under dilatation or SU2H. So it just means that the cohomology classes will not have proper eigenvalue. But we'll see how this bookkeeping function shows up to be useful anyway. So now I've chosen this supercharge. I'm going to look at the cohomology of that supercharge. So I'm going to look at first the origin. So let me look at operators inserted at the origin, which are Q closed, but not Q exact. It's a relatively straightforward exercise using conformal or the superconformal representations of this algebra over here to find out that at the origin, the solution to this cohomological problem is precisely the Higgs match coloring. So O of zero, if it like satisfies this, is a Higgs branch color ring operation, which I characterized over here. Now you do this computation, and since you don't have a Lagrangian, what is how do you construct Q and S, for example, exactly? No, I mean I know that the algebra, well I know that the theory, Lagrangian or not, has this symmetry algebra. Mm -hmm. and Q and S are just generated from its algebra. Or you just use the rigid algebra, commutation rule. That's right. all? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Right. So now I know what the cohomology of my favorite supercharge in this theory is. I would like to, at the origin, now I would like to move away from the origin. Now it's clear that the only way I can move away from the origin while staying inside the kernel of this Q is to use a Q exact, a Q closed translation operator. Again, you can just look at the abstract algebra, OSP4 slash 4R, and figure out that the only choice you have is to use a generator that looks schematically like P, a momentum along some line, plus zeta times the SU2H lowering generator. So there's no way I can just translate my operators using normal you know, momenta. The reason is clear. I have a special conformal charge system here, so this, this P will never be annihilated like this Q, uh, by this S on its own. But this combination does do the job. And it means that while I move away my operator from the origin, I'm not just giving it position dependence. I'm also mixing in SU2H lowered components. So remember that. Over here, I wrote the most general uh, schematic form of a higgs branch kara ring operator. It was in the SU2H highest weight state. So when I insert this guy at the origin, and I start moving it away using this uh, generator, I will not just change its position dependence, but I will also start lowering these indices because of this extra piece over here. This has nothing to do with conformal boost, does it? Or H minus? No, no, this is just. Yeah. The lowering component yeah. of this SU2H yeah. over here. But naively, I would consider conformal boost because that would generate S. And I, uh, how can I say this? I mean, conformal boost goes together with translation generator normally, right? Uh, right, right. But that doesn't happen here for some reason. Okay. It is, I mean, you just need to look at what uh, is, well, like commutes with this thing. Mm -hmm. And you will find that this is the only option. Commutes with it. Yeah. 
Yeah. Usually Q and S and like can just say P's and you know everything else, right? So not P's. Sorry, not Q. When is I ask you to do M and SU2 R, SU2 C stuff. So you're picking a Q that has bracket zero with itself and then S has bracket zero. Yeah, it's just a single Q. A single Q all the time. It has to commit to itself. It's not some major combination of single Q. Just one Q. So I have this generator which allows me to translate the operator at the origin away from the origin. And as I was saying, uh, let's do this as an example. As I was saying, it will end up being inserted at a point S, where S is some coordinate along this line. And it will take the form that all of its S2H indices, they are contracted with a certain fixed doublet of SU2, which explicitly looks like so. So this is just informing us written out what the exponentiated action of this guy does on such an operator. So again, in words, it just means when I move along this line, I'm not just moving, I'm also rotating in S2H lower components, which is reflected here by this bottom component. So at the origin, S is zero, this thing is just one zero, and I get back to this guy, but when I move away, I'm mixing the lower components. Yes? Well, can I just say that every index, so there's like one data for every index, what's S, sorry? No, S, sorry, it's not an index, it's, it's a coordinate along the line. It's this coordinate. Ah, okay, thank you. There's one zeta, and so this thing is plus a times zeta s minus two plus s squared. So at this point, I have constructed the cohomology classes of this Q. And the next question I would like to ask is, what is the algebra of these cohomology classes? But before I will present uh, the abstract expression for this algebra, I will uh, try to convince you in a simple example how the general result will look like. In the simplest example of an n equals 4 SCFT in three dimensions, is of course the free hypermultiplet. So the free hypermultiplet, of course, it has uh, two complex scalars, which I denote Q, Q, Q tilde and Q. They sit in SU2H doublets to, together with the complex conjugates. So these are doublets. It's exactly like an N equals 2 in four dimensions. These are the SU2 doublets. And in fact, because I'm looking at a free scalar, it has an USB2 flavor symmetry, or equivalently, an SU2 flavor symmetry, which swaps these two columns. So these four real scalars I will represent as follows. So here i is the flavor index. The flavor index just acts by rotating the two columns. The a is the SU2H index, which acts by flipping the two rows. So, of course, I'm, I'm focusing on the scalars because I will be interested in the higgs kara ring operators. higgs kara ring operators, in this simple example of the free hyper, is any monomial you can write down in the scalars Q1 for pi. So, of course, they're Lorentz scalars, good. They're singlets under SU2C, just like it needs to be. They sit in the highest weight state of S2H. Moreover, a free scalar in three dimensions has dimension one half, which is precisely the S2H uh, eigenvalue of this guy. It's also a half, since it sits in the duplet. So any monomial in these guys will be a higgs kara ring operator. So the higgs kara ring looks like what it, it looks like so. What are the components of this Q1i for i is 1 and 2 compared to the first column or yeah. second? The second the top. Well, the top uh, two entries, I understand. So, 
Yeah, so oh, of course. Sorry, sorry, you've written it right. I'm sorry. Okay. So another ingredient that we will want to keep in mind is the Poisson bracket on this fit French ring. So on the simple elementary letters, it looks like like so. It's just epsilon i j. And you can generate Poisson brackets of any element in this ring by just doing the usual. And the final ingredient is the OBEs of such scalars. So the OBE of two such scalars is it's essentially uniquely fixed by the symmetry. It looks like this. Where I use the scalars that I mentioned I have. And I will also write completeness the first non-singular term, which is a composite operator. Okay, this is just to get notations down. So now let's let's start to run this program. The first thing I want to do is to construct these cohomology classes. We already know they have the origin. It's just monomials in uh, Q and I. Now, if I move away from the origin, I'm going to pick up this position dependence depending on the S2H indices. So in general, I will get that an operator inserted at a point S will look like Q1i at the point S plus zeta S Q2i at the point S. They will be interested in the cohomology class of this. Now there's one thing I should have mentioned over here already. This operator was Q closed as it had to be if you wanted to stay inside the kernel when translating. But even more so, this thing is not just too closed, it is also q gapped. So any position dependence I gave over here, it's actually, within cohomology, totally trivial. But there is one caveat you should keep in mind. In the other, if I have multiple operating insertions along this line, while the piecewise position of these operators is indeed trivial, you should be careful about the ordering of the operators because there is no way I can take two operators around each other while I stay inside the cohomology. So position dependence S is totally trivial. Why is that? <coughs> it's just an algebraic fact. Um, you can figure out some combination of superchargers here that will precisely give. It's the other cube, right? It's so some cube and some S. The other cube yeah. that gets yeah, q cube is p, and then to get this lowering thing, you need to have an s involved as well. It's, it's an algebraic exercise. So, really, the cohomology class of this operator doesn't even depend on the position anymore, but we need to keep it, keep at least the ordering in mind, so I'll keep it as a little label for the time being. So, over here, this cohomology class not depend on S. This S dependence is Q exact, but I will want to keep track of where exactly along the line it is with respect to other operators insertions I may have. So good, I have this cohomology class. It's for the single stick match chi ring operator, namely just a single Q. And let me then just look at the algebra of these cohomology classes. I take one at zero, I take another one inserted at S, and I just look at what the OBE tells me about their product. So it's clear if I have a guy sitting at zero, this piece is gone, I have a Q1i. The only non-zero contribution can possibly come because of this epsilon from something which has a two index. So it must come from here, from the other guy. When it comes from here, I pick up this zeta times s. There's an absolute value s downstairs. So in total, I will find the zeta s absolute epsilon ij over absolute value s plus the composite again. So s over absolute value s is of course just the sign of s. So 
So this is the, the algebra of these cohomology classes, at least of these particular examples. And at this point, I really want to get rid of these extra curious labels. We know that position dependent is Q-exact. We know that we just keep track of the ordering. So let me just introduce a symbol, which I call star, which tells me that the product is taken for operators ordered along the line from left to right. So I'm just going to notice star as the ordered product of things. And this will just be zeta epsilon ij plus qi qj at the origin. So if I take the end commutator, uh, sorry, if I take and symmetric part of this, the, only the first term will survive. Right. Okay. Yes. Yes. And this psi is um, not a constant. Is it a constant? No, it's not it's a constant. It's a okay. bumping yeah. point. No. It's but now it's a constant because it's the value to the origin. No, no. This zeta that came about when I defined this q. It was this zeta. It just book it. It's yeah, a constant, but it can take any value. It's a constant. It's a constant. It carries some complex it, number. It carries some indices. Uh, no, 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 no indices. No indices at all. No. Oh, I see. Because Q and S, they both carry the same Q and S carry same indices. Type, uh, no, not the same type. That's that's the entire point. Well, they do not the carry the same type. Yeah. That's why Q does not have proper eigenvalue <coughs> under certain generators. Okay. The bookkeeping purpose of zeta is to reinstate the properties, the transformation properties under dilatations in S P H, but it's just bookkeeping. Because this Q does not have to act proper, uh, does not have to have a proper eigenvalue under say the dilatation operator. There's no reason to. Yeah, but, but if, if I have a dot and non dot that indices for a spinner, let's say you have Q alpha and S alpha dot. No, then to make no indices work. Hmm? Well, I mean, I'm not going to get them straight from the top of my head. But there's two indices for SU well, there's an SU2H index, there's an SU2C index, and there's a Lorentz index. Okay, you're right. You're right. Three dimensions, so they are my random spin. Yes. Okay. I'm with you. Okay. They take specific values, and there's no reason why they should have the same values from here to here. Sure, sure. It just means that Q does not transform properly. Thank you. And zeta soaks up the non-proper transformations. And this P line plus zeta, whatever, it doesn't. It looks like a, I thought you were going to say it's a holomorphic line, but now you're actually using the S is real. Right? I thought this would be a holomorphic line, generating a holomorphic line, but you're actually somehow using that S is real. No, the line is, no, we're not doing 4D or chi algebra, so the line is really just the real line, like, like this, and S is a coordinate along that line. There's no homomorphicity or anything, it's just a, a line in three dimensions. Wait. And so the, the line is chosen, line of course, by R minus R minus is real in some sense? I'm sorry. This is real? That thing is real? I mean, I, I just designed this thing such that it is Q closed, such that when I use it to translate, I will stay inside the kernel of Q. There was no other requirement on, on this translation operator. So we just. I do have a thought that a coordinate dual to a complex op generator should be complex, but. This is just, this is a, a P itself is just a real. Ah, okay, I see. That translates me along the line, and then I do some function yeah. business while I move around yeah. the line. Yes. I, I was really confused because I was thinking that this line was a line in the uh, No, no, it's the line is space. Space. Yeah. And these operators. This is translation space. Yeah, I see. Space time. So these operators, should, should I, I, I shouldn't think of them then as. I, are the keys the coordinate? What is the hypercalic cut in this case? Just R4, right? It's a hypercalic cone, it's just C2, yes. Yes. And the Qs are the coordinates of it, right? Yeah. But are you, so are your operators built out of Qs? So they're functions of Yeah, the Qs operators are polynomials in Q. Q. So polynomials in Q. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. Any monomial in Q will be a fixed match carrier in operator. So I mean geometrically what we do is while we move along this line, we're also rotating, if you like, the hypercalic screen. Okay. But we're, this is just a space-time line. Okay. When I move, I act with 
the lower income part of the as well. So I obtained this formula for the star. Let me just call it the star product since I used the notation star. For the star product of these two cohomology classes. So the first observation to make is, is that it is not commutative, obviously, because of this epsilon ij. And the second observation is that this epsilon ij is actually precisely the Poisson bracket on this hypercalar, on the coordinate ring over this hypercalar cone. And the third observation is that the zeroth order power in the series in zeta, which sits here on the right hand side, is just the old fashioned product in eight fresh calorie. So there's three observations to make from this formula. And in fact, you can now look at the star product of any monomial, any heat mesh calorie operator. So let me do that over here. I take any monomial, let's say k of them, start with a monomial built out of L Qs, and the result will be The result will be while algebra. The result will be the Moyle Weil the Moyle Grunewald star product, which is what you said as well. So to get this result, of course, I'm using that theory of the free hyper. I can compute uh, any OP of any composite using the big theorem. Using big theorem, theorem, I can figure out the star product and it takes this form, and as anticipated, this is just a model product, which, for example, appears when quantizing a single three particle, or the phase space of a single three particle. So now you see where the title came from. I wrote that information quantization. This, of course, is just an instance of a quantization of physical phase space. So, are there any questions at this point? So this QI depends on space-time coordinates. We are in 3D. I'm in 3D, but so as I said, over here. So at any point in space? No, not any point. I'm searching space. along this line. Oh, sorry. But the position the dependence along this line was Q exact. Uh -huh, okay. So the only information that I really need to keep in mind is the ordering along the line. Uh -huh. And this star symbol takes that into account. It just declares that this guy sits to the left of this guy on the oriented line. Oh, I see. And those are derivatives, they act one half to the left and not the other. And this QRQJ term at the subscript, is that zero? Or yeah, uh, it's so, means... sorry. At this point, it's, it was this position label, but it's not necessary anymore. This is just the cohomology class of QI, QJ. So no matter at what point they are on that line, they commute with each other. Is that the point? Those two, the second so term. QI, QJ so equals not, QJ, QI. Yes, sure. This is, yes. Yes. This is just the product in the car. Ordinary thing, product. Just commutative, yes. Commutative yes. product, yes. Uh, regardless of where they sit on the line. Exactly. Okay. Because their position, their dependence is QI. Okay. So with this example, I will now just write down the most general star product on any H branch carrier ring of any three-dimensional angle support theory and discuss some of its properties, which can all be derived by just looking at selector rules and just general OPE uh, properties. So the general structure. So let me take any three-dimensional helical support so from form of field theory. Let me look at its H branch. It's some hypercalor cone. Let me take the holomorphic coordinate ring, which in physics language is the same as the H branch carrier ring. And let me go through this entire construction and write down what the star product of two it branch countering operator should look like. It's zero order term, just like over there, is the ordinary product in the it branch counter. It's first order term, 
is a Poisson bracket. So remember in the beginning I told you that uh, viewing the Hitler ring in a particular complex structure, you have a natural Poisson bracket. This is that Poisson bracket that shows up here. And then there's a higher, there are higher order terms in zeta. where CK are some bilinear functions uh, acting on two copies of the Lankara I will discuss this upper bound in a second. So this is the general structure. It's a straightforward generalization from that. And you can actually argue for it um, from looking, by looking at OPD of a generic 3 d into sport theory. So first property that the star product should have is its associativity. Remember that the associativity of the operator probably algebra was exactly what the conformal bootstrap equations uh, tell you to look at. And this associativity goes down to associativity of the star product. Now you're going to describe generalities of deformation quantization, right? No, no. This is generalities of the structure I get from physics by doing this entire story. So this is a general structure from physics. I'll come to, to math in a second. Now the star product is by definition, I take two cohomology classes, yeah. I look at the uh, product induced from the operator product expansion, and the star just means that this one sits to the left of this one. Yeah. So I can use the spurious position labels, which were pure exact anyway, except for the order. Excuse me, that formula follows from this formula if f and g are monomials, of course. But can I take an arbitrary now, function now? I mean, what kind, what kind of function mm -hmm. can I this, take? This is not, I'm not looking at the free hypermultiplet anymore. I'm looking at any three-dimensional any for super formal field theory with some x branch. So f could be any uh, function of f the scalars? Is, f is a x branch carrier ring operator. Mm -hmm. I mean, I think should think of the like abstract operator, not it's necessarily an abstract operator, yes. some function of the if, hyper scalars. If you like to think in terms yeah. of the UV Lagrangian description, mm -hmm. then you can realize these guys in terms of the arbitrary hypermultiplet scalars. But I'm not doing that. Okay. This is just an abstract operator. Mm -hmm. and this one. Okay. So the star product has to be associative. It's a direct consequence of the conformal bootstrap equations. The second property is, as I've been advertising over, the, over there, that zeta really has a bookkeeping function to keep track of AC2H charge. So here it comes, um, here it will show its usefulness by realizing that the star product needs to preserve AC2H charge modulo through the, the understanding that zeta actually carries one U of AC2H charge. So this, in the math literature, this would be called equivariance. But for us, it's just the statement that SU2H charge is conserved if you give zeta one unit of SU2H charge. The third property is, as I have written here already, the statement that first order term in zeta, or at least no, first order term in zeta is the Poisson bracket. Yeah. I'm getting, I got confused. So I thought. The reason I was asking whether you're going to tell us generalities mathematically is because you didn't say what the CKs were. No, I will. Well, I, I will. Are not. you saying that if you do the, the physical prescription, you will actually generate CKs, and then with those, you will have the first property? Yes. I see. So physically, I just think if you were uh, in a situation where you know the operator product expansion of two of any operators, oh, sure. like, but yeah. in particular, if you have separate operators, operators and you just put it through the cohomology, and you will get some very definite answers for what these guys are. Yeah. And with these definite answers, this thing has to be associative, because the original problem was associative. It also needs to be equivariant, meaning just SU2H charge is conserved. So notice that because SU2H charge is conserved, this sum cannot run off to infinity. It, it's a finite number that sits here, because, well, you at one point you will run out of SU2H charge because these guys, well, x branch carrier ring operators have positive S2H charge, so at one point this sum was just stopped, truncates after a finite number of turns. The third property is what I was saying over here, so Poisson bracket, 
at order z to the first. The fourth property, it was already obvious over there. It's also obvious over here in the first two terms, but it holds more generally for the entire tail that the even powers in zeta are symmetric if I exchange m and g. The odd powers of zeta are anti-symmetric. This is just a consequence of S2H indices, how they act if you pull them through an open. So well, even, this is what I would call evenness. Even powers of zeta are symmetric, odd power and symmetric. And this is an asymmetric term. This is a symmetric term. A fifth property is again very physical. These operators, they sit in some representations of SU2H. And it is just a consequence of SU2H selection rules that on the right hand side, you can only have operators which actually appear in the decomposition of uh, the tensor product of these two representations. So that means in particular that this sum will be truncated after even fewer terms just because I cannot have operators in two small representations appearing in the tensor decomposition of the product of two SU2H representations. So these are what we call truncation. And the final requirement that physics tells you should be true are unitarity constraints. So the unitarity constraints I will use in the form as follows. Given any complex operator O, I can look at its two-point function with its permission conjugate. Conformal symmetry tells me that a two-point function necessarily take the following form with n some number depending on the operator O. And this number necessarily, well, first of all, it's real, but second of all, it's positive. It looks like a simple requirement, but well, it has to be true. If there are any constant terms in the star product, they necessarily have a very definite sign just following from the unitarity constraint in a, a physical unitary three-dimensional form field theory. So these are the six properties that I can abstractly derive for this star product. And now, of course, the question is, are these properties enough to actually bootstrap this star product? Is it enough to, uh, are these properties enough to write down this star product uniquely given some minimal information of the three-dimensional theory? And if so, how much is this minimal information that I need to provide for this uh, bootstrap problem to have a good, unique solution? So that's the question I would like to ask now. And uh, well, I've got one bullet here. The mathematicians will actually help us with this question. Since in the math literature, people have studied what well, there goes under the name of deformation quantizations of the holomorphic coordinate ring of hyperkeyo manifolds. So there they study star products on what we will call the Hittelash chiral ring, satisfying these first three properties, where I need to slightly amend this one by saying that the anti-symmetric piece at first order in zeta is the plus one bracket. For our purposes, this, this extra anti-symmetric piece it doesn't do anything because we have this evenness property that told me that the first order term is anti-symmetric anyway. But for mathematicians, they, they do not necessarily impose these conditions, but they look at uh, star products satisfying these three conditions. And then they actually classify how many inequivalent star products a certain hyperkähler cone, well, holomorphic core ring over hyperkähler cone can have. And they have a very definite answer, and it's a finite answer. So this is very encouraging. Mathematicians tell me that inequivalent star products come in finite families. How finite is finite? Very finite. <laughs> like Just 100, 10? The, we'll do some examples so that I still have time. Yeah. It's like, let me already say now, say I look at C2 mod Z2, the answer will be 1. So very fine. But there is one caveat. And the caveat is that I have been saying there's an equivalence. The, the inequivalent star products have a finite uh, classification. 
I didn't tell you what this equivalence is. And actually, this equivalence seems to, to kill any hope of finding the star product. Because mathematicians, they say, well, if I have a star product satisfying these three rules, I can find another star product, that we call a star tilde, also satisfying these three rules by applying what they call a gauge transformation. And this gauge transformation, the, the freedom in this gauge transformation is just huge. Because any operator, let me maybe call it H, I can apply the gauge transformation, which I call T, by sending it to itself plus a higher order tail in zeta, where this tail needs to satisfy, again, that this equivariance property, namely that the SU to H charge is preserved if zeta has been assigned unit charge. So for any single <coughs> operator, any composite operator, any operator, I always have this redefinition freedom, according to the mathematicians, because I can define this star product now as being F star tilde G is T inverse T of F star T of G. And this new star product will again satisfy these three properties. So at this point you will say, okay, I'm dead. This, this is an infinite, I mean, it's a super infinite degree of freedom that I would not know how to deal with. Were it not for the fact that I have here these two properties, this truncation property and this unitarity property, which tells me that certain coefficients in this star product need to have definite signs. And these properties, they are not invariant under such gauge transformations. And you definitely know one thing that this is a gauge transformation. This, this comes from their desire to have a semi classical yes. Yeah, so from their point of view, changing H with zeta dependent stuff. Indeed, in the same class for the unit which sends zeta to zero. So it, it's, from, for them, it's really an equivalent operator, T of H or H itself. In, in well, sometimes we meet it as well, these are like ordering ambiguities. We, we may have to deal with them, but we do not want to deal with them in this context. Right? But as I was saying, these two properties, they're not invariant under any arbitrary gauge transformation. So in fact, they play the role of gauge fixing conditions. And the claim I want to make, and for which I will present some evidence and examples, is that this, these conditions are perfect gauge fixing conditions. So this is, it's a very strong claim because, again, this is an infinite, a very infinite uh, freedom I have over here, and yet I'm going to fix it with these two seemingly simple conditions. What about property four? Property four, I mean, mathematicians know how to do it. It doesn't change the story much if they it, it makes it a little bit more finite. It cuts out That's some possibilities okay. of the star problem. I see. Can you just remind me real quick why why you shifting it like that won't change the fact that the first order is giving you plus on? The asymmetric piece of oh. first order. So it's this asymmetric that, that does the job. That's why I added it explicitly. So the symmetric pieces will change whatever it wants, but the asymmetric piece is invariant. And this is also, of course, what mathematicians want, because this quantization deformation, the fact that this quantization comes from, if you would take the anti-commutator arising from the star product, you would pick up zeta times Poisson bracket plus higher order stuff. And that's what you would like a quantization to be like. Do you know that they're always also? Well, from physics we know the mass structure. In the math literature. So, uh, so you, you have the math transform, and then you impose five and six. Yes. No. Okay. I do not know a priori that there should be a solution. And we will see that there are there are ranges in the parameter space where there is actually no solution. So yes. The assumption that you have a ring is already there, right? It's lurking in all this discussion. Well, the ring structure is, is this first order. This is the commutative associative ring. Mm -hmm. So that alone is not enough to say you have a ring. Uh, there's a lot more that's needed. Right? Well, yeah. these okay. are all properties that follow from physics. Okay. Quantization deformations, they would typically have 
these first three properties, and they take as input a commutative associative ring, they spit out as output an associative, but not any longer commutative deformation thereof, where the deformation is in the direction of the Poisson bracket, meaning just that this first order term in its axiomatic field is Poisson. So let's do some examples. As I was already mentioning over there, let's start with theories which have as their Higgs branch C2 mod Z2. This, this hypercalar column goes under the name of the A1 climbing singularity, or also the minimum important orbit. Given this Higgs branch, I, I pick a complex structure and I'm going to look at its core lettering. Core lettering will be, if I think of it as a climbing singularity, a polynomial on x, y, z, subject to the relation of x, y, z to the z squared. This is the standard description of a climbing singularity. Or if I think of it as a minimum important orbit, I just want to organize x, y, and z into a triplet to a triplet of SU2, so A is an adjoint index of SU2, subject to the relation that in the symmetric product of two single is known. This is the same. It's, well, Z is a Cartesian if X, Y is raising a lower. So good, this is the Higgs branch carrier ring. I'm not going to write the Poisson bracket, but it's, it's well, I can write by some part. It's just the commutation relations you get from SU2. So this, this Higgs branch arises in, say, a U1 theory with two hypermultiplets. So this is UV Lagrangian description. If you flow to the infrared, you will find superconformal field theory. Its Higgs branch is precisely this thing. So what's that? Say? It's U1 gauge theory with two hypermultiplets. Okay. And finally, the math result, as I already alluded to, tells me there is a unique star product satisfying these, in fact, I also included the evenness condition, these four properties. So there's a single parameter I should fix. Let me call that parameter lambda. Those are the f and d term equations in the theory you just wrote as a right. Okay, so now the question is how do I want to go about constructing this star product? The simplest approach would probably be I just write the most general ansatz for the star product of any element of the Higgs branch carrier ring with any other element, and I impose properties 2 to 5. Once I've written that down, I impose that it's associative. Once I have solved for all these associativity constraints, I can imply apply the unitarity constraints and demand that certain coefficients have definite sign. It's a very valid approach. It's, it's probably the most bootstrap approach you can take to this problem, and you would find the answer. But given this deformation quantization stuff that the mathematicians have worked on, it's probably more economic to just write down what the mathematician like to think is the solution to this, these three conditions, and then fix this gauge freedom mentioned over here by imposing these conditions. So let me take that approach. I'm going to write down the quantum algebra, by which I just mean the algebra that actually solves conditions one and three. So in this case, it's, it's the universal enveloping algebra of SL2 modified by the statement that the quadratic Casimir takes some constant value. So this, this universal enveloping algebra is just the algebra of three, well, it's all polynomials in x, y, and z satisfying essentially this relationship. And I model out by the ideal that the quadratic chasm should take some constant value. So this is the answer. Maybe people are more familiar with higher spin algebra. In that case, it's also equal to the higher spin algebra. 
So I have now written down the solution to the star product, at least the first four bullets over here. What was lambda again? Lambda is just a free parameter. Math, the math classification tells me there's a unique, uh, up to equivalences, there's a unique star product satisfying these four conditions. And in fact, in this particular example, there is just no cage freedom. If I insist that the star product is also SU2 covariant, so notice that this theory has an SU2 flavor symmetry. It's, it's essentially identified with the symmetry that rotates this new way. If I insist that the star product is also equivariant with respect to that symmetry, that it respects this flavor symmetry, then there are just no gauge transformations that can apply simply because of the structure of this ring. At any given dimension, there's only a single operator transforming in some representation, and at every given dimension, it's a different representation. So if I start adding in operators with lower dimension, then they cannot possibly have the same transformation properties as the original operator. Therefore, there is just no gauge freedom in this example. So that's it, I'm done. I have written down the answer to the star product over there, and by doing so, I have actually solved for an infinite number of non-trivial OPD coefficients. So remember that the structure constants of the star product, they arise directly from the structure constants of the operated product algebra, and they are therefore three-point couplings in physical theory. Oh, maybe I should mention that you can compute this lambda. It's an independent computation you can do using localization techniques. For this theory, you would find that lambda is one half. So now I really have solved everything. Why are you doing what? Do you fix lambda? Sorry. Localization. Localization. We can talk about it. Okay. okay. Well, I'm, I'm already okay. probably running out of time. So I just would like to mention to conclude that. This A1 Kleinian singularity, you can generalize in two directions. The first direction is by looking at, say, the A2 Kleinian singularity or A3 and so forth. The other one is by looking at mean only for the orbits of other simple Lie algebras, and we call those G. So let me just mention, just like for this example, all minimally important orbits, once you write down the quantum algebra, once you figure out the three coefficients, which, in, well, it, it gets more and more if the rank of G gets higher. Sorry, let me say that again. So the mean only for the orbits have, that was completely wrong, have a unique star products. If I insist on one, two, three, four, mean only for the orbits have a unique star product. I can write it down explicitly. I know the structure constants even. Those have been worked out by physicists, and I'm done. So this case is completely under control, and again, this, these gauge transformations, they, they are innocuous because of the same mechanism, just the symmetry of this case prevent me from having to consider such corrections. So they're uniquely determined, there's not even a single parameter, they're unique. Can G be an exceptional group? Uh, they're unique, and given <coughs> their structure constants, I have again solved for an infinite number of non-trivial OPD coefficients. In this case, good. This case is a little bit less trivial. Here, the gauge transformations are to be considered. They are non-trivial. You need to impose property five and six, try to constrain them, try to constrain them more. And if you do that, then indeed, you find evidence for the claim I was making earlier that these gauge fixing conditions are in fact perfect gauge fixing conditions. Um, I guess I'm essentially out of time, so also this case is They think you have the word one dimensional topological algebra. What oh. happened to it? Well it, it's, <laughs> it's sitting over here. Is it that? It's yes. this. Right? It's but the word topological topological just refers to the fact that it's in the fundamental position. Oh you can okay. stretch a line to the whatever. It's just topological. You only you only have to care about whether it's to the left or the right. That's it. Okay. I see. Alright. Yes.
is there any role for deformations of these singularities in your story? Well, yes. So I have I have not told you what the mathematicians actually tell me that the classification is. So let me maybe say that now. They tell me to in physics language though. Um, in physics languages tell me take hyperdial cone and look at the space of empire parameters which resolve a singularity. That space is a finite space, and if I mop that space out by the wild group of flavor symmetries acting on the Coulomb branch, and this may be a bit weird that I'm talking about Coulomb branch all of a sudden, but it just comes from the fact that uh, MI parameters can be turned on by giving pairs to uh, background vector model that's called topological symmetries. So through this set of words, you figure out that the value group of the Coulomb branch plays the same thing. You could think you act, uh, you model out by that group. That is the finite space mathematicians tell me classify uh, the information point station sets by one, two, three. If I also add in four, I need to additionally impose that the FI parameter actually lies on the same file or orbit. Again, this value group being the one from the flavor symmetry of the Coulomb branch, and it's negative. So this is the sense in which these deformations, this is the, the deformations of the conical structure show up. But we do not, we never leave the suitable form of field theory. We never turn on masses, we never turn on applied parameters. We just stick purely to the conformal uh, the theory. So in our case, we always have the conical single. Uh, Okay. You can think of it. This is this is what I just said, right? Yeah. So you just fixed it. Is that why? Is that why you can fix it? Or how? Yeah, it's yeah. physical. The, okay, the fact that I can fix it comes from the fact that I can actually compute uh, <coughs> two-point function of flavor symmetry currents. So using localization techniques, I can compute explicitly the two-point function of flavor symmetry currents. It takes some canonical form which I cannot be remembering, but it comes with some number. This number you can compute. So there's some position dependent, of course. This number you can compute using the S3 partition function. And, okay. and I, I can tell you more if you're interested, but yeah. it's not directly related to, to the notion that these parameters are counted by a parameters. Okay. One more quick question. If I do this for n equals 6, Theory. What would I learn about the space of CFTs? I would think of n equals six theory as an n equals four theory. So going from n equals six to n equals four, I have some extra flavors in this, which used to be R symmetry. All that is fine, and then I just do exactly the same. I look at the Higgs branch of these theories. I can apply my star product. It, it it gets simpler in the fact, in the sense that I have more flavor symmetry. As we noticed over here, the fact that these are unique is a consequence of flavor symmetry. So. But what would I learn about ABJM models if but I don't you would, know? You would compute that. an infinite number of OPE coefficients. Oh, involving this. In, uh, involving this H branch carrying on. I see. That's the catch, right? That's all. That's like the bottom line of I this see. talk. I have gone through this entire story. Is it called solved at, the end? at that point for, the, for that part? Is it solved? Is it solved? Or not? Okay. It comes with some caveats. Well, I mean, in this case, it's really, really solved because there were no gauge transformations I needed to worry about, and these structure constants have been written down. Soft, really soft. For this case, it is morally speaking soft, because then I do have to take into account these gauge transformations for every single operator and all of its composites. And uh, algorithmically, you can only do that like order by order, and at one point you just run out of steam. So it's, it's morally soft. That yeah, and by, by acting on some supersymmetry transformations, I cannot generate other uh, correlators, right? I and mean, I'm stuck with the uh, chiral ring sector, that's it. I yeah, well, as, I, as I was saying over here, yeah. I have related, say, the flavor two-point function mm -hmm. to correlation, about two-point functions of these these branch chiral ring operators. So yeah, you can play games where you go through the multiple mm -hmm. and relate things using supersymmetry. So the flavor symmetry current sits in the same multiple as a moment map. The moment map is a heat run guy ring operator. Mm -hmm. It's in fact, this is Z over here. So the two-point function of Z is related to this number that appears in the two-point function of the flavor symmetry current. So it's 
So there are games you can play running through the multiplayer and seeing how much you can still learn. If you like to write things in superspace, you just need to figure out how many superspace structures can actually appear. Okay. And that's I'm sure there will be a lot more questions. Thank you. Well, thanks for your guys. You gain I mean, one of the things you did in the very beginning is you were really trying to keep track of the, 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 the zeta is really just the uh, inhomogeneous coordinates on the QR. Right? You're keeping track of those. But you could have asked, said, well, what if I wanted to keep track of my Q, my spin representation? You could have just said that box Q, so you could have contracted it.